had a good day. I have a real bad tendency a lot of times of just, you know, going straight to the heart of it. I don't want to... Jump right in. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of jump right in. So there's a couple announcements I want to make, and um, one of them is if you have not signed up for the study, there's no cost or anything like that, but one of the reasons we like you to sign up on the app or online is because we get your email. And that way we can notify you if there's any uh, changes or if there's any information. Like, for instance, if today was a holiday and we weren't meeting, you would have gotten an email. And so today was a holiday and we were meeting, so hopefully you did get the email. Also, our wonderful Margie McCoy back there has a box uh, for a prayer requests because a few of you ladies talked to her last week and said, uh, you know, you'd like to um, give her some prayer requests. And so she has agreed to uh, pray over the requests that you'll give her. And uh, so if you would, if you'd like to do that, there's some paper in the back and a box that says prayer requests. You can just drop them in there and it'll be private. Also, I did want to let you know, another organization I'm really fond of, or I, I, I'm the care team leader for, is Hope Restored India. How many of you guys have heard of Hope Restored India? Okay. It's an organization uh, in Southeast Asia that helps women come out of sex trafficking and learn a vocation so that they can support themselves. So this Sunday, uh, the 22nd, I'm having, heading up a bake sale. Uh, for that. If anybody thinks about it, if you'd like to bring a baked good or a store-bought good, uh, the more we have, the more people we have to stop by. Or if you want to stop by and grab a goodie, we'd love to see you do that. So it goes for a good cause. So if you happen to be in the area, we would definitely appreciate that. So let me go ahead, open up in prayer. Let's take a deep breath. This is as much exercise as you're going to see me do. Um, <laughs> deep breath, let go of the day. Just kind of leave it at the door. Don't get too relaxed. You'll fall asleep. Um, but kind of leave whatever it is you've got going on. Just let's let it go. And like Mary, sit at our Lord's feet tonight and just receive what he has to say to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just the opportunity to be able to come together and to hear what you have to say to us, Lord. I just pray uh, for each and every one of us, we have a need in our life. We have a trial or we're facing a struggle or we have a question. And Father, we need your guidance. We need your answer and direction on those things. And so Father, we come to you and we want to sit at your feet and we want to hear what you have to say. And so Father, I just pray that through the power of your spirit that you would minister to that to us tonight, Lord, if we're hurting, that you'd bring healing. Give us new and renewed hope. And we just ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So today we are in Nehemiah chapter 2. Again, if you don't know where Nehemiah is, it is between Ezra and Esther. It's E-N-E. -E. So if you can remember that, and if you don't know where Ezra is, it's going to be a lot harder to find it. But if you do know where Esther is, just go backwards. So that's something. And if you recall from our study, our last study, we met a man named Nehemiah, the author of this book, whose name, by the way, means the Lord's Comforter, which I thought a great name. Uh, Nehemiah receives word from his brother Hanani that the city of Jerusalem is in ruins and there were no walls to protect the people and those who were living in the city and the surrounding areas are living in fear. They are vulnerable to the enemy and to their attacks. Now, Jerusalem, we know, is God's city and the place where God's people had worshipped in God's temple. And the temple had been rebuilt during the time of Ezra uh, but the walls of the city were still torn down, and the people were still just eking out a very meager existence. Uh, Nehemiah receives this word uh, from Hanani, and he is greatly grieved by the struggles of his people, so he takes his burden to the Lord in prayer. And then at the end of chapter 1, if you remember, we read the statement that said, and I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, this puts Nehemiah in direct access uh, to the king of Persia, uh, a man who obviously could get things done. But Nehemiah didn't rush into the throne room to petition the king for help because this wasn't how things were done in the palace. This, remember, we have to remember, this is not a democracy. Nehemiah doesn't have a say in how things are to be run uh, or where he could go or even what he could do personally. Nehemiah was a servant to the king, and therefore that meant that he was at the king's mercy. I want to go ahead and read chapter 2. It's 20 verses, so I'm going to try and read as quickly as possible. And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, the wine was brought before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And then I was very much afraid. 
I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. Verse 7, And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. And then I came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent, me, sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. And when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were consumed by fire. And then I passed on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. And then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. And then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words, which he had spoken to me. And then they said, let us arise and build and so they put their hands to the good work. But when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and, the, and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. Nehemiah, mourning for the condition of God's city and God's people, pours his heart out to God in prayer. And from the time that he receives the news from Hanani to the time when the king asks him, why is your face sad? Nehemiah continued to pray. Notice the time frame, if you will. In uh, chapter one, verse one, it says, now it happened in the month of Chislev. Chislev is the month of November and December time frame. And then in chapter two, verse one, it says, and it came about in the month Nisan, that is March to April time frame. Um, Nehemiah sought the Lord for wisdom and for direction for approximately four to five months. Now, Nehemiah spent his time seeking God's will and asking God for wisdom. We know that wisdom comes from God. I think that is why we are having such a hard time in this country, is because we know that all wisdom comes from God, and when you reject God, you reject wisdom. And God's wisdom is revealed to us as we take time to seek God to be in his word, to sit at his feet, and to listen to his voice. And this often means that there is going to be a time of waiting. Now, I will confess, I find waiting difficult. Anyone else here struggle with that? There you go. I've also found that a dialogue with God is not the same as talking to a person because God speaks only when he has something to say. Now, I am the type of person who likes to sit across the table from someone and talk through issues. I talk, and then they talk, and usually at the end of the conversation, hopefully we both walk away with a plan or with a feeling that someone has heard us or someone has responded to us. But talking to God isn't usually like that. Uh, God, I found, is not a chit-chatter. Uh, God speaks when he has something to say, and he speaks when we are ready to listen. Now, to hear God's voice, we need to cultivate silence and stillness. Now, that can be very difficult to do in a culture of ongoing activity and very prevalent social media. 
Chuck Swindoll writes this about this in his book, Intimacy with the Almighty, in a chapter entitled, Being Still, the Discipline of Silence. He says, we are commanded to stop, literally, to rest, to relax, to let go, and make time for God. Now, he writes, the scene is one of stillness and quietness, listening and waiting before God. Such foreign experiences in this busy time. Nevertheless, knowing God deeply and intimately requires this discipline. Silence is indispensable if we hope to add depth to our spiritual life. Silence, he says, makes us pilgrims. Uh, writes, one advocate who protracted uninterrupted periods of quietness are something that we are supposed to develop. It sharpens the keen edge of our souls, sensitizing us to those ever so slight nudgings from our Heavenly Father. Noise and words and frenzied, hectic schedules dull our senses, close our ears to his still small voice, and makes us numb to his touch. Now, I know practically most of us cannot sit around all day in silence, but we must learn to cultivate times of stillness and silence and incorporate it into our daily, even busy lives. Now, some of us, I don't know about you, but uh, try this when you're cleaning around the house. Leave the music off. Talk with God. Tune your mind into the things that he wants to speak to you. Same thing in the car. When you're driving, learn to sit for short periods of time without any noise or any distractions. Get up early and take 30 extra minutes to meet with God and to meditate on his word. Noise and crowds have a way of siphoning our energy and distracting our attention, making prayer an added chore rather than a comforting relief. God's word in Psalm 4610 says, Be still and know that I am God. God does not speak to the hurried and worried mind. So it takes time alone with God, with him and in his word, before we can expect our spiritual strength to recover. It is also during this time that we receive instructions from him and we are to recognize what the next step is. Now, some of you here have already heard this story. I believe I used it the last lesson, but I think it accurately illustrates this point. A woman and her husband were taking a trip uh, to South Carolina. He was piloting a small plane, and she was in the passenger seat when he had a heart attack. Now, she didn't know what to do, so she took the controls, and she radioed for help, and she was saying, help, help, won't somebody help me? My pilot is unconscious. Authorities who picked up her distress signal were not able to reach her by radio during the flight because she kept changing the channels. Eventually, she ended up making a rough landing and had to crawl 45 minutes to a farmhouse for help. Too many times we don't channel in to what God is saying or wait for his response. We just keep going from thing to thing, hoping something will happen to help us, wondering why we don't hear God's voice. Nehemiah has been praying and seeking God for at least four months. He has been waiting for God to open a door for him and asking God to prepare him to recognize that opening when it comes. In this chapter, we see God open that door. End of verse 1. I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, so the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And then it says, Then I was very much afraid. Why was Nehemiah afraid? Well, again, we have to understand that the king has absolute authority over life and death. One word from the king, one word, and Nehemiah could be thrown into prison and even executed based on the king's whim. It's not like us, it's hard enough, it's not like us going to our boss's office and asking for a raise. I mean, it's scary enough, but our life isn't hanging in the balance if our boss is displeased. He's not going to have us executed or thrown into prison. Now, if the king thought you weren't happy serving him, it was a simple thing for him to replace you with someone else, or at least someone who looked like they were going to be happy to be there. Aren't we glad that we can come into the presence of our king when we aren't happy and when we need help. But I find a couple of things interesting here. One, it would appear that Nehemiah had not been sad in the king's presence before, or maybe the king was so preoccupied he never noticed it, but it was evident this day that he was grieving in the king's presence. 
this tells me that Nehemiah's heart was still very burdened, so much so that he was unable to conceal his grief from the king. Two, the king notices it. Now, kings aren't in the habit of noticing the mood of their servants, but on this day, the king's attention was drawn to Nehemiah's countenance, and he asked Nehemiah, why are you so sad? This, Nehemiah recognizes, is the opening that he has been waiting for. This is his opportunity to speak to the king about what is on his heart and on his mind. But Nehemiah is justifiably nervous. What if the king doesn't like what he has to say? Verse 2, then I was very much afraid. Someone once said, courage is not the absence of fear. It is pressing forward in faith even when we feel afraid. We overcome our fear of man when our fear of God is greater. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. And then Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Nehemiah justifiably feared the king, but Nehemiah feared God more. And he chose to put his trust in God, believing that God could and would work through the heart of this man. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. We must learn to trust God to work even through imperfect people. Now, this is not an easy lesson to learn. Trusting a perfect God is one thing. Trusting God through imperfect people is another. If you remember, Sarah learned this lesson through her husband, Abraham. At least two times that we know of, Abraham hid the fact that Sarah was his wife and said instead that she was his sister, uh, which was a half-truth because she was his half-sister. As a result, Sarah, at least two times that we know of, ended up in the harem of the king or a pharaoh in Genesis 12 and again in Genesis 20, tells us this. Both times, God intercedes for Sarah and causes these rulers to return her to her husband, blessing Sarah and Abraham through her faith in God. Her husband may not have been doing the right thing, but Sarah was by entrusting herself and her situation to the Lord. In fact, when I look back, I think most of Abraham's wealth actually came through Sarah, because each time she was returned to him, he was given livestock, donkeys, servants, camels, land, and silver. It is never easy to trust God through another person. I find it much easier to trust God directly, but God asks us to trust in him even through others, like our husbands, our bosses, our parents, and even politicians. Those people who have been put into positions of authority in our lives have been placed there by God, and God will work through them and in them to accomplish his purpose. Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. God is in control, and he alone has the power over life and death, promotion and demotion, we need to commit our ways to him. We need to give him time to work in us and in others and recognize and be ready for those opportunities that we've been praying for when they come. Nehemiah then tells the king what is in his heart and on his mind in verse 3. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And then the king said to me, what would you request? Nehemiah's prayer from the previous chapter is answered. He finds favor with the king. So Nehemiah boldly makes his request. But before he does, we notice that he pauses for a word of prayer because it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah throws up a quick prayer because the power of prayer, ladies, is not determined by its length. Nehemiah prayed long, but Nehemiah also prayed short. When he was seeking the Lord's will and wisdom, he prays for over four months. And I'm sure some of that he spent in long nights of prayer. But in this moment, 
He knows he needs to get it right, and he asks God quickly to give him the words that he needs to speak. There are times for long periods of prayer, and there are times when a short prayer is all that is needed. I often I relate to this story, maybe you will too. Dwight L. Moody had a practical mind that never let a meeting get out of hand. Long public prayer particularly irritated him. Once, when one of the men took too long to pray, Moody told his song leader Sankey, lead us in a hymn while our brother is finishing his prayer. <laughs> I have to confess, I don't have a lot of patience for long public prayers either. A good rule of thumb is to pray long privately, pray short publicly. Both prayers can be effective. You happen to remember Peter's prayer? He had stepped out on the water to come to Jesus, but as he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to sink. And when he does that, Peter doesn't pray, Oh, thou art God, great in might and power, will thou save thy sinking servants from the great water of the seas that are overtaking him? No, instead, he simply cries out what he can before he goes under, Save me. And Jesus does. James writes, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It is not the length of our prayers, but the strength of our prayers that matters most. And you can bet that at that moment, Nehemiah's prayer, however short, was very fervent and heartfelt. Verse 5, I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I gave him a definite time. And in verse 7, and I said to the king, if it pleased the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. Now, it sounds to me like God has been speaking to Nehemiah during his months of prayer. We see by his request that a plan has been formulating in Nehemiah's mind. As he has been praying, he has also been preparing and planning. He knows exactly what he is going to need to make this journey. Prepped in prayer, Nehemiah steps out in faith, he makes his request to the king, and he finds that God has already gone before him to prepare the way and provide all that he is going to need. Now, most of us here have heard the expression. It may have come from Pastor Chuck Smith. He says, where God guides, God provides. How many of you ladies have heard that? Me too. And I believe that to be very true. But God's provision doesn't always come at once. You ever notice that? It often comes when it is most needed. One of my favorite stories, if you'll remember in the Old Testament, was the widow that cared for Elijah. How many of you ladies know that story? Okay. When the prophet Elijah comes to her, she is getting ready to make one, there's a famine in the land, there's been a drought, and she's getting ready to make one last meal for her and her son because they've run out of food. They're on their last little bit to make a cake. Elijah then comes to her and boldly asks her to give him her last bit of food, and he promises her that if she does, God will continue to provide what she and her son will need, and even provide for Elijah as well. 1 Kings 17, 15 says, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. God often provides what we need when we need it. And if God is calling us to do something or to go somewhere, then the fact is he is going to provide what is needed to make that journey or to do that job. What has God called you to do? It could be working at a job that is very difficult or even making a decision to leave that job. It could be caring for little ones or for older loved ones. It could be just stepping out into something new. Whatever the job or the ministry, we have God's promise that God will help us and he will provide for us if we remain focused on him. 
We have this promise in Matthew 6.33 saying, seek first God's kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things, the things that we have need of, shall be added unto you. God says, if you put me first, I promise I will take care of everything that you need. Now that is not to be confused with everything that we want. God doesn't work that way. Remember, this was God's burden placed on Nehemiah's heart. So since God is a good father and God is a good provider, God is going to make sure that Nehemiah knows and has what is needed when it is needed. Now, I have seen this, and I hope you ladies have as well, time and time again in my own life. God has always been faithful to provide what we need and when we need it. Usually, he provides above and beyond what we could even ask or think in any given situation. I found that if I don't have it, then God knows that I must not need it, and I need to let it go. But that doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy. Assignments from God don't always mean smooth sailing. Ask Paul. He was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten and imprisoned numerous times. We need to keep in mind that we have an enemy, and his task is to keep us from accomplishing God's purpose on this planet. I've also discovered something else. Satan makes things difficult, but God makes things impossible. What do I mean? Well, I learned this lesson many years ago when I was traveling to Arizona to visit a friend. What was supposed to be a five-hour trip turned into an eight-hour drive. The traffic was so bad, and it was taking so long that at one point, I was ready to turn back. Have you ever been there where you just thought, I'm, I'm so over this, I'm going to go home? We pulled off the freeway, and I called my friend, and I let her know we might not be coming. And I can't remember exactly what she said to me, but the gist of it was this. The devil likes to make things difficult for us, but he cannot thwart the plans of God. He can only try to discourage us from seeing it through. We decided at that point to pray and to commit the rest of the trip to God. And we decided that if God didn't want us to continue, we asked him to please make that clear and that it would not be possible for us to go on. Remarkably, the rest of the trip was an easy drive. We arrived at her house in about an hour and a half, um, and lesson was learned. Had I decided to turn back, I would have missed that, and I would have missed that lesson. The devil likes to make things difficult, to slow us down. He wants to convince us that difficulties and delays mean that God is not in our present circumstance, when the opposite is often true. God will provide what we need, but he doesn't always prevent us from experiencing opposition. Verse 9, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. And when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. Nehemiah steps out in faith with God's permission and with the king's favor, and yet he still encounters difficulties. Peter also understood what it meant to experience opposition when he writes this in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you as though some strange thing were happening to you, but rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. And yet, what is usually our first response when opposition comes? Hey, God, What's happening? Why is this happening? Why is this strange thing happening to me? Well, the Bible promises us that in this world, in this life, we are going to have trials, we are going to have tribulation. That is a promise you can take to the bank, ladies. We are told in this life to expect trouble. We have an enemy. Our enemy is Satan, who is described as a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So it's little wonder that when the enemy gets wind of a movement of God by his people, that he sends out opposing forces. I think the Christians of old understood this a little better than we do today. It's illustrated in this story about John Wesley. Perhaps you've heard it. It says the great preacher John Wesley was riding along on his horse one day when he realized that three days had passed and he had not been persecuted in any way. Not a single brick had been thrown in his direction, He had not even been hit by an egg. 
So he actually stopped his horse and said out loud, could it be that I have backslidden slidden, or I have sinned? Slipping down from his horse, he knelt on one knee and asked the Lord to show him if there was anything wrong with him spiritually. A man who disliked Wesley saw him kneeling in prayer, so he picked up a brick and threw it at him, barely missing the preacher. When Wesley saw the brick fly by, he said, Thank you, Lord, I know I still have your presence. <laughs> no wonder why he was such a wonderful, powerful preacher. If we are going to be effective for the Lord, we need to understand that we will face opposition and even attacks from the enemy. Remember, it was Jesus that said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You know, I often hear people pray this um, when I'm gathered in a group for prayer and there's some event or something that we're doing. I'll hear people pray, Lord, please help everything to go smoothly. But we live in a fallen world and we know that God isn't always going to answer that prayer the way we want. If everything always went smoothly, we really wouldn't learn much about trusting God, would we? I think the better request for prayer would be, Lord, give me strength when things go wrong and help me to meet each and every challenge in the power of your spirit. Where there is a movement of God, you can be sure that there is a parallel movement of the enemy to stop that, word, uh, that work and to thwart God's plan and his purpose. These two men... Sanballat and Tobiah will devote themselves to making things difficult for Nehemiah and for God's people. Well, Nehemiah and his party finally arrive in Jerusalem where they rest for three days. But Nehemiah chooses to head out one night to survey the city on his own. Verse 12, and I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were consumed by fire. Nehemiah continues to inspect the gates and the wall at night under the cover of darkness. Just him and a few other trusted men, he then returns to where he is staying. Verse 16, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Why was that? What's with the secret night mission? Doesn't the Bible say that where there are many counselors, uh, there is wisdom? This is true. We all need people in our life that we can trust. People who will give us good advice and godly counsel and people who will hold us accountable. But it is equally important, if not more so, for us to get along with God to assess the situation, to see things for ourselves, and then to ask God to reveal the hard truth to us personally. We must learn to pray as David prayed in Psalm 139, Lord, search my heart, try me, and know my thoughts. Reveal to me if there are hurt, any hurtful or sinful ways in me, and then lead me in your way. It is God who knows all things, and sometimes even trustworthy people in our lives who genuinely love the Lord and love us can be genuinely wrong. Do you remember David's counselor, Nathan? David's desire was to build a house for the Lord. And David tells Nathan, his counselor, about this desire that's in his heart. And Nathan then tells David, go and do all that is your mind, for the Lord is with you. It sounds like a great plan, and it sounds like great encouragement. But Nathan was wrong. God didn't want David to build him a house. It was for David's son Solomon to build the house of God. If you remember, Job also had good friends, godly men who came to sit with him during his trials, and yet all of their supposedly good advice was incorrect because they did not have the whole picture from God. Nehemiah took with him trusted men, but he wanted to see the situation for himself, and he wanted God to tell him exactly what needed to be done. We must have good and godly people that we trust to talk to. But there are times when the voices and the opinions of others can cloud or interfere with the voice of God in our lives. 
Now, there is an old Jewish expression, I don't know if you've ever heard it, that also applies to Christians. It says, where you have two men, you have three opinions. And this can also cause difficulties. As Nehemiah surveyed the ruin and the rubble, it became a good time for reflection. What had brought this once great city to a place of ruin? Now, if this were a movie, ladies, this would be the flashback sequence that we'd be watching. Um, how did God's people come to this? The fact was it was their own sin that had brought them to this place of destruction. For many years, God's people would not give up their idols. They would not put God first, nor worship him alone. They were warned time and time again by the prophets, men like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others who were sent to tell God's people that if they didn't turn back to him, then God would raise up foreign nations to take them into captivity. The book of Hosea, if you've ever read the story of Hosea, it's a story of a man who marries a prostitute. And even though he is kind and gentle and loving, she continues to prostitute herself and to seek out other men. Hosea's relationship with his wife, Gomer, becomes an allegory from God for the story of God and his people, Israel. No matter how much God loved his people and gave to them, they continually turned away from him and went after gods of other nations. Eventually, they became like the surrounding nations in their idolatry and in their immorality. Ultimately, God gave them over to their desires and they experienced the consequences of their actions. I would teach in fourth grade in children's ministry. It was one of my favorite grades because they got so much. And I remember using an example of a rat trap. You have to use visuals when you're working with children. Sin is like a rat trap. We are drawn to the temptation of the cheese, the little tidbit that's in there. And we nibble at the cheese, convinced that we are never going to get caught. And then one day, the trap springs, and we are caught, trapped. We cannot get ourselves out. Our lives are in ruin, and we and others are left seriously injured. Satan works like that. Satan is like that drug dealer who gives us our first taste. We experience the high, and our flesh desires more and more over time. And then that desire becomes more and more intense, and there is little or no satisfaction, only an empty an ongoing craving for more. We eventually will lose interest in the good things of God and we chase after those things that will lead us down a path of eventual destruction. And that is why we are told in Romans 13, 14, make no provision for the flesh nor seek to gratify its desires. Satan is looking for any foothold in our lives, any opening, any area of weakness that he can exploit or use to diminish our walk or destroy our lives. This is where the children of Israel find themselves at this time. They are living in a desolate land, surrounded by a pile of rubble and ruin, the result of decades of disobedience. Our disobedience to God and his word will lead to our distress and eventual destruction. But God always desires our good. He calls us to draw near to him, his desire is to be our safety, our security, our stronghold. He wants to be our wall of protection from the plots and the plans of the enemy. He is our good shepherd who cares for his flock. His desire is to see his sheep grow strong and healthy and to thrive even during our difficulties. But sometimes a shepherd will notice that when one of his sheep persists in wandering away, the shepherd then has to break the legs of the little lamb. And during that time of healing, he will place the lamb over his shoulders and carry her until she's healed. Our safety and our security lie in the nearness of our God. The farther we get from God, the more we wander into enemy territory and the greater the risk of the attack. The psalmist writes, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good, I have made the Lord God my refuge. We've all seen those National Geographic specials. You ever notice it's always the lagging one in the herd who's left behind that gets picked off by the predator. You can almost predict it as you're watching it. So I will ask you this question. Is there an area of sin in your life that you are allowing as an access point to Satan? 
Are you currently experiencing any consequences in your life that can be traced back to sin or disobedience to God's word? If you're not sure, ask the Lord. Too many times we don't connect the dots between our disobedience and the difficulties that are in our lives. Now, I'm not saying that all difficulties are a direct result of sin. They aren't. Many, def uh, many difficulties come through our disobedience, but they also come through our obedience as well, and that's why we need to ask the Lord. But I think it is important for us to recognize when we are experiencing the consequences of our own sin so that we can learn from these lessons. Too many times we blame God for bad things in our lives when we have only ourselves to blame. Remember, our God is a good father, and as such, as a good father, he disciplines his children. Hebrews 12, 5 says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, but to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness." Israel's disobedience and their disregard for God and his word led them into 70 years of captivity. They didn't trust God. They didn't put him at the center of their lives. Part of their sin, if you study this, was connected to God's command to rest on the Sabbath. God had, if you remember in the Old Testament, God had commanded that his people were to rest on the seventh day. It was called the Sabbath. This was a day that was to be dedicated to the Lord. But the Sabbath was much more to God than just a day of rest for his people. The Sabbath rest represents the trust of his people. In Exodus 16, if you'll remember, God supplies manna for his people. It's bread from heaven to feed them when they were on their way to the promised land. God instructed his people to gather just what was needed every day for six days, instructing them through Moses not to leave any of it left over until the morning. But of course, the people didn't listen, and some of them decided to leave some of it until the morning, just in case, you know, God didn't come through. <laughs> when they woke up the next morning, what did they find? They found that the saved manna was rotten and full of worms. God had instructed them, look, on the sixth day, you are to gather twice as much because he didn't want them to go out and gather on the Sabbath. Exodus 16, 26, he says, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. That seems pretty clear. Doesn't that seem pretty clear? Don't go out and gather manna on the Sabbath, right? Pretty clear. So what happens? And it came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Some people you just can't reach. God, sounding a little frustrated, says to his people, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? The Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. This is pretty clear. It's still pretty clear. In other words, I've given you supplies and instructions, people. Why can't you just follow them? You ever feel like that? Dealing with your children? Dealing with other employees? No, that never happens to anybody here. <laughs> Not only did God promise to supply their needs on the seventh day, he also promised them he would supply their needs for the seventh year. Leviticus 25, the Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I will give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field, nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical rest. God tells his people they are to plant and harvest their field for six years. But the seventh year... They needed to let their land rest. We know nowadays that this is very good for the land because soil can become very stripped of nutrients. If you've seen anything about what happened in the Dust Bowl in this country in the 1930s, you can see how important this is because that soil was completely stripped. But the true test for God's people wasn't about soil. It wasn't about manna. 
It was about trust. Did they trust God to supply what they needed, even if they allowed their field to go fallow and untouched? Then God takes it one step further. We've got the seventh day. We've got the seventh year. And in the same chapter of Leviticus 25, verse 8, he says this, you are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to 49 years. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be called a year of jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his own family. After 49 years, after seven Sabbaths of years, there was to be a release of personal debt. If you owed someone or they owed you, all that year, all debts were to be completely forgiven and completely wiped out. God's people were to be given a new start. This was called the year of Jubilee. All property was to be returned to the original Israelite owner, and any Jewish, Jewish servants who had gone into indentured servitude were to be set free in this year. God's people were not to take advantage of their brother. Uh, one man or one tribe was not to become more powerful than the other. God goes on in that same chapter of Leviticus to promise his people that he will provide for them saying, then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather our crops, then I will so order my blessings for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the crop for three years. You give me this one year, and I will give you three years worth of harvest. To boil it down, God is saying to his people, if you do what I tell you to do, I will take care of you, I will provide for you, but you must trust me by obeying me. The same principle applies to us as his people. Our trust in God is lived out in our obedience to God. We cannot have one without the other. Now, we may not see or understand how God is going to take care of things. A lot of times we don't. But God is saying to us as his people, put your faith in me and trust me, I'm going to take care of you. Hebrews 11.6 says this, without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Just as true for God's people today as it was at that time. Sadly, God's people, the Israelites, never fully trusted him. They never allowed the land to rest, and they never once in their long history celebrated a year of jubilee, all because they never fully took God at his word. God's people neglected the yearly Sabbaths and jubilees for 430 years. They missed 70 Sabbath years. You can read about this in Ezekiel 4 if you're interested. Therefore, God tells his people, since you never trusted me by resting, I am going to take what is owed me, 70 years of Sabbaths. In Jeremiah 25, God tells his people they will be taken into captivity to Babylon and spend 70 years there. And in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, it says, so the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord through Jeremiah. God is serious about what he says. And in the book of Nehemiah, Jerusalem and its surrounding countryside lay in ruins because God's people refused to believe him and obey him. Resting in God means trusting in God, choosing to believe what he says is true and then acting on it, whether we understand it or not. And believing God is more than mentally acknowledging that God's word is true. It is putting his word into practice. Too many, believer, uh, too many believers think that hearing God's word, reading God's word, and even studying God's word is enough. But all of this knowledge makes little difference in our lives if we are not practically living out God's word. James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. The fact is, it's very easy for us to delude ourselves or to convince ourselves that we are doing what God says, even when we aren't. 
we're all prone to self-deception. Much like that person who talks about diet and exercise, looks up low-calorie recipes on the internet, buys new sneakers, and wears workout clothes, but she or he never diets or exercises and then wonders why they haven't lost any weight. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't use the example of exercise. Anyway, Nehemiah, after surveying the situation and assessing the damage, gathers the people together. Verse 17, and then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in? That Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. That's an interesting word we don't use a lot, reproach. It means to blame or to bring discredit upon something. Israel's sin and the consequences of that sin brought shame upon God's people. And when God's people are shamed by sin, then the name of God is also shamed by our sin. God, in his great love and grace, uh, allows his own name to be dragged through the mud by his own people. He could easily have separated himself from his people. He could wipe his hands of them and walk away, but God never does that. No matter what we do, he promises that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We need to understand the mindset of the people living at this time, and even in some cultures today. If you were strong and rich, prosperous, and successful, that meant that your God was strong and successful, that he was pleased with you. If you were weak or had been taken captive or defeated in battle, that meant you had a weak God or he was unhappy with you. There was this uh, my God can beat up your God mentality that was going on at the time. Of course, we understand that our God is the only true God and that his strength surpasses that of any man-made God that was worshipped at that time or at this time. But that concept uh, was foreign to other cultures and uh, is even in some cultures today. Yet even in our sin and in our shame, God chooses to endure the results and the reproach with his people with an eye to restoration and rebuilding. Nehemiah speaks to God's people, verse 18, and I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's word which he had spoken to me. Nehemiah knows things are bad. And, but he chooses to dwell on the fact that God desires this work. That even though their own sin has brought them here, God has not abandoned them, and that he is already working behind the scenes to bring about a good result for them. So he speaks words of hope and encouragement to his people. Nehemiah knows that there's a lot to do, that things look pretty broken down now, and that it's going to take some effort on their part. But Nehemiah also knows that God is with them. And that God wants to partner with his people to rebuild and to restore that which was lost and that which was broken down. Joel 2.25, one of my favorite verses, God says to his people, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. This is the heart of our God. No matter how badly we've messed things up, no matter how broken we are or how bad the situation is, God is always there to help us pick up the pieces to restore through the rubble and make something beautiful come from the ashes. If we are willing to turn to him and to trust him and work with him, he is going to bring about a good result. Psalm 86.5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon thee. Doesn't matter what's in our past, even in our present. God is always willing to give us a brand new start. Encouraged by Nehemiah, the people respond saying, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Haven't you found that the beginning of a project, that the beginning of work is so much easier than the ongoing work itself? Anybody else found that? I mean, that's why so many New Year's resolutions, oh yeah, I'm going to do this. It's easy to get excited when we begin a new project. It's not always so easy to stay on task, especially when things get difficult. And as we continue to read, we find that not everyone is on board with a new building project. Verse 19, when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official um, and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? When we take on God's heart, and choose to enter his work, opposition will most certainly come. It's as if Satan knows when God is moving, and he plans a counter-movement. Remember, Satan is a brilliant strategist, 
but he can only guess at what God is doing, and he is limited by God for what he can do. God will often allow opposition. He knows it's coming. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter in Luke twenty-two thirty-one? I love this conversation. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Now, I don't know about you, but my first response to that statement from Jesus would have been something like, what does that mean? You told him no, right, Lord? Instead, what does Jesus say? He says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, you will strengthen your brothers. Opposition's going to come, but we can trust that God has allowed it and that we can trust that God will use it not only to strengthen us, but to encourage others as well. We are promised tribulations in this world, but Jesus has overcome this world, and Romans 5, 3 tells us we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proving character, and proving character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Walking in God's word and entering into his work will almost guarantee trials and tribulation, but God can and will work in these situations to bring us into a closer relationship with him and to encourage others as well. Now, God doesn't always or even often stop opposition from happening. Instead, he uses it, have you noticed, to create a story for his glory. Some of the greatest human interest stories or biographies I've ever read are those that have overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles, opposition, and impossibilities. We love these stories, as long as we aren't the ones living them out. But the fact is, these stories cause a sleeping world to sit up and take notice. Many of you have read the book or perhaps saw the movie years ago called Unbroken. Any of you ladies seen that? That's a tough one to read and a tough one to sit through. Louis Zamparelli endured terrible things during World War II. He was a pilot, and his plane was shot down by the Japanese, and he and two other crewmen survived in a life raft for 47 days, only to be finally uh, rescued, picked up, um, by the Japanese in the open sea, just when they were close to death. And then they were put into a prisoner of war camp where he and the others endured unspeakable torment and torture. Lewis was singled out by the camp commander, and as you were reading the book, you were amazed, absolutely amazed, at what this young man was able to endure. No one could have endured this kind of treatment and survived without the strength of God. So I knew, even though I didn't know Lewis Zamperini's stories, I knew as I was reading this book that God was in it and that God was going to use it. Louis Zamperina, many years later, when he came home, came to Christ after the war. But you could see the hand of God all through his life as he endured pain, suffering, alcoholism, mental breakdown, and finally redemption, resulting in his ability to forgive those who had brutally tried to break him in the prison camp. I have found that God will often allow people to go to deep, dark places of despair so that his glorious light may be made more visible to a dying world. Because a diamond appears all the brighter against a dark backdrop. And these stories of trial and triumph cause a sleeping world to wake up and to take notice. We see this in the cross of Christ. Satan threw everything that he had at Jesus in the darkest moment of human history, and yet God's glory was seen all the brighter for his sacrifice and for his suffering. Turned out to be God's greatest victory and our greatest gift. We must learn to expect difficulties and disappointments because God's word tells us we will have them. Yet when we are faced with them, we often cry out in confusion. Lord, why is this happening? What is going on? Don't you love me? Don't you care about me? To the contrary, God says, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. I know I need to keep a long-term perspective on what I am going through. Uh, the problem is I am usually too nearsighted to see the potential outcome through God's perspective. But Nehemiah has an eye to the future. He trusts in the Lord his God, and he boldly answers his opposition with these words in verse 20, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion 
right or memorial in Jerusalem. Nehemiah is not intimidated by their threats nor or the power that they might have. He remains focused on the word and the work that God has given him, and he trusts that what God will do, he said he will do, he will. So he calls the people, arise and build. I don't know what you're facing today. Could be something big, could be something small. We're not all facing an overt attack from the enemy. Sometimes it's actually the small things that trip us up. Song of Solomon 2.15 says, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. It is not always the big battles that cause us the most trouble. Sometimes it's the little compromises or what we like to consider little sins. They will lead us down a path of eventual destruction simply by drifting further away from the presence of God. Nehemiah remains focused and steadfast. He doesn't listen to the lies or the threats of the enemy. Like David facing Goliath, he is focused on the greatness of his God, not the schemes, the size, or the strength of his enemy. So ladies, let me encourage you, let us likewise emulate the example of Nehemiah, and let me just give you a few things here in summary if you are seeking God for something. One, pray. Take the time to seek God in prayer. Ask him to speak his directions into your mind to guide you. Ask him to prepare your heart for him to open a door and be ready to walk through that door in boldness when it comes. Two, get alone with God to survey the situation. Ask him to search your heart. Is there any hidden sin? Is there anything that might be displeasing to him that might hinder his will or his work in your life? Three, rest. Take time to be still and to be silent. Allow God to recharge your batteries and reveal to you the work that he wants to do. Be in his word and take some time during your day to meditate on what he has shown you. This is where God speaks understanding to our minds and this is where the plan is formed. Four, choose to be an encouragement to others. Ask God to make you aware of any opposition you might be facing and how to deal with that opposition. Then look for ways that you can be an encouragement to those around you. And then finally, stay focused on who God is, on who he says he is, and what he can do. Shut your ears to the lies and the threats of the enemy. Put God first and allow him to take care of the needs that you have. If we choose to walk in faith in him, and obedience to him and his word, then he will do what is required. He will guide us and he will direct us each and every step of the way. Psalm 37, 5, I'll leave you with this. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he will do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a great and mighty God of heaven and earth, Lord. There is nothing in our hearts and our minds and in our lives that you do not know. There is nothing so big that you cannot deal with it, Lord. There is nothing that is out of control. Each and every situation that we have in our life, each and every difficulty, each and every discouragement, Lord God, you have a plan and a purpose for. And so, Father, we pray that you would make us aware of that. Strengthen hands that need strengthening. It can make us weary, Lord. We can be tired. But I do pray, Lord, that we would seek you, that we would take that time to refresh ourselves in you, to recharge our batteries, Lord, to rest and to be encouraged. And then, Father, let us, uh, when you fill our cup, let us flow out onto other people, Father. Let us encourage those around us who need that encouragement. Let us be your hands and your voice to a world who desperately needs to hear from Jesus, Lord. And we pray this in the name of our Savior. Amen. Thank you, ladies.